Dr. Eric Helms, you're one of the biggest experts in the world on building muscle. And in fact, look at those peaks. Eric, hit a little front bow bicep of the camera. Proof to the audience, you know what you're talking about. That's Eric Helms, author of the Muscle and Strength Pyramids, Muscle Building Expert, and Natural Bodybuilding Pro. In this video, I wanted him to teach you how to maximize muscle building. You have a pyramid. I do. You'd like to tell me about. I have what's known as the Muscle and Strength Pyramid. Um, ironically, this was something that I created all the way back in 2012 through 14 because I found myself on Skype calls with clients at the time when I was a full-time coach saying the same things repeatedly because people didn't have a lack of knowledge, but they were not able to put all of those pieces of knowledge in context and prioritize them into kind of a usable hierarchy to where they could apply it to training. Eric first created the Muscle and Strength Pyramid to clear up some confusion around which parts of training were most important and how best to train to build muscle. After all, there are so many variables. Time under tension, proximity to failure, tempo, technique, exercise selection, volume, and so much more. The pyramid serves to tell you what to focus on. So the base of the pyramid in, say, you know, the hierarchy of evidence that we use in evidence-based practice is the least important. But in this pyramid, I think of things as we're building a foundation. So the things at the top of the pyramid, they only sit there because they rest on a, a solid foundation. So the base of the pyramid being the most important thing for training is adherence. And one of the biggest issues that I would frequently see is that people would try to construct a quote-unquote optimal program but it wouldn't align with their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And it's because they didn't have the critical thinking skills and the knowledge to know how to adapt a program. So they would go, right, well, here's this five day per week program this pro bodybuilder follows. They're a pro bodybuilder. I want to look like that. Let me do it. By the way, I have a full-time job, two kids and prior injuries, and the gym's 45 minutes from my house where I want that stuff to work. It'll go fine. And they are unable to follow it. Pick a program that is going to be sustainable for you. Only you know what that looks like, since you're at the center of your own life. You need both the motivation and time to follow the routine. The best program is the one you actually do. Once you've considered your practical constraints, where do you go from there? Like, what do you look for first? What's the most influential variable? Yeah, from there, we're essentially looking at the stimulus. Um, and when I originally conceptualized the pyramids, I described that as volume, intensity, and frequency. Uh, modern data would indicate that when you equate for volume, frequency is not a major player as far as the actual stimulus for strength or hypertrophy, but you absolutely can manipulate volume by manipulating frequency. But when you equate for volume, that no longer becomes a significant factor based upon multiple meta-analyses that we have now. But they are intrinsically linked. You know, when you manipulate any one of these, it has a potential downstream effect on the other. But more or less, what we're looking at is the dose. We're producing overload by manipulating the variables of volume, intensity, and frequency, and we're organizing it with frequency. Volume corresponds to how many sets you do for a muscle in a given training week. You simply add all the sets you're doing up for each workout in that week for a muscle. Relative intensity refers to how close to failure each set is taken. How many more reps could you have done before hitting failure? Finally, frequency refers to how often a muscle is trained in a given training week. To build the most muscle, here's what Eric recommends doing. Start somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to 20 weekly sets for a given muscle. This will be a decent starting place. For example, for your back, that could be three sets of pull downs and rows on Monday for six total back sets, and three sets of pull downs and rows on Thursday for another six back sets, for a total of 12 weekly back sets, which falls into this range of 10 to 20 sets. What about training to failure? Um, we have some awesome recent data. There's a great, uh, not yet peer-reviewed and fully published, but I've heard through the grapevine that it has been accepted, uh, meta-regression uh, that was done by now Dr. Zach Robinson and colleagues, uh, where they looked at proximity to failure, quantified by RIR, and hypertrophy, looking at the general relationship, but also some really interesting moderators. And one of the most interesting moderating factors is that load, once you're getting around roughly 80% of 1RM, it seems to make that relationship between getting closer to failure, inducing more hypertrophy, much less meaningful and potentially maybe not even a, a thing. And this makes sense when you think about it. If you're lifting heavy, you're already close to failure because you can do fewer reps. Additionally, when you do higher reps, a meta-analysis by our own lab suggests that you tend to overestimate how close to failure you really are. So, Eric recommends training farther from failure earlier when going heavier, 
perhaps leaving 2 to 4 reps in the tank, and pushing a bit closer to failure, perhaps to 1 or 0 reps in the tank, when training lighter. Eric also recommends not going to failure on big lower body compound lifts, like squats, since those tend to wreck you for the rest of the workout. So, 2-4 to four reps in reserve earlier into a workout for lower body compound movements, for upper body compound movements around 1-3 to three reps in reserve earlier into the workout. From there, for isolation movements performed later into a workout, taking them somewhere between a couple reps in the tank all the way to failure is solid. Importantly, Eric also mentioned the importance of a person's past experience. I would prefer that someone actually use good, well-tracked prior training data to inform their volume selection. But in the absence of that, then the meta-analysis, in my opinion, is the best guess. As far as frequency goes, Eric recommends muscle groups be trained two to three times a week, with roughly one day per week of frequency for every five to ten weekly sets you perform for a muscle. As an example, if you're aiming for 15 weekly sets for your chest, you'd want to train it at least twice a week, but could train it three times a week. This could be an upper lower split four days a week, a push-pull leg split six days a week for two days of chest training per week, or an upper lower split six days a week for three days of chest training per week. Are there other variables besides these that might be less influential, but that we still want to consider? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is the one that people get confused about, where I, I put progression as the next step up in the pyramid. And I think the misunderstanding here is that Progressive overload is a foundational principle of all adaptation, but people misunderstand progressive overload, um, especially in the context of hypertrophy. They get really focused on the weight on the bar, and they really start to borrow principles from strength training. Ultimately, I think a useful way of conceptualizing progressive overload for hypertrophy is that if you produce overload, you should see progression, and then if you continue to match the demands of overload, which will mean still training relatively close to failure, still training in reasonable rep ranges. That means your loads will go up or you'll need to do more reps with that same load if you're achieving the same RIR. And now all of a sudden you're realizing that the overload allows progression. And since we don't actually care about the rate of strength gains or the absolute gain in strength, which we've seen in multiple studies is not directly related to hypertrophy, but is associated with it over time. Okay, now progressive overload is I can progress because I've overloaded and now I can use strength gains or increases in performance as a diagnostic criteria of going, am I producing enough overload? In other words, you need to present a sufficient stimulus to elicit an increase in muscle size and improvement in strength. Because you presented the stimulus, you'll be able to lift more in the future and achieve progressive overload. Progressive overload is an outcome of training. But for hypertrophy, it's more of a diagnostic tool where you want to see, listen, if I've been training for 12 weeks and I'm an intermediate and I'm doing the same reps, the same load at the same RPE on all my movements, I'm probably not making progress mm -hmm. and I should do something about that. Gotcha. So that's very important. It's kind of like the check to make sure that the, the, the level of the pyramid below, which is the, the stimulus, is actually stimulating an adaptation. Let's say you're doing three sets of 10 at RPE 8 or two reps in reserve. Would you try to add reps week to week to say go to 11 reps or would you add weight? Is there a preferred method? I think a good method that works for a lot of different rep ranges and that is a little more built-in auto-regulation that I really like is what I describe as double progression. And you can even call this an auto-regulated double progression model. So double progression just simply means that you're progressing load once two other factors have gone up, right? So let's say I prescribe 8 to 12 reps at a 2 RIR right? That means you're going to select the load and where the set ends, you're performing somewhere between 8 to 12 reps and you think you're about 2 reps from failure. Once you can actually do either your first set, 12 at a 2 RIR, or your last set, which means you've, the first set was probably easier than you thought it was at that same guidance or that same, within those same guidelines, it's time to increase the load. And this means that you don't have to force anything week to week. Because again, for hypertrophy, it's not about the rate of progress. It's about can we observe it happening in a reasonable time frame that we think is appropriate for your training age. The double progression method has a few benefits. First, jumping weight on lateral raises, for example, every week is nearly impossible. However, if you just add reps for a few weeks before trying to add weight, this becomes much more feasible and easier. Exercises with a low absolute weight to smallest weight increment ratio benefit from double progression the most. Second, 
double progression sets realistic expectations for progress. Beginners might be able to progress in weight every week. More advanced lifters won't. Once you've sorted out your progressive overload, where do you go from there? What other variables? Yeah, so this, this is a contentious one. Exercise selection is the next one we have up in our hierarchy of training. So long as you're stimulating the muscle, it doesn't matter. But then you're like, well, what does that mean? Because clearly, if I was to compare a leg extension to, say, like a lying back, very rare form of a leg extension, we're going to see more rec fem growth. Mm -hmm. Or a seated leg curl versus a lying leg curl. So we can't just interchange any exercise. But the argument I would take and the way I would set up the parameters of this, this uh, organizational structure is that if a given exercise meets what we think are the appropriate principles for hypertrophy, then where you place exercise selection is far less important than things like frequency, volume, and progression. So instead of worrying too much about the exact exercise you're doing, Eric recommends thinking of exercises as categories. While a leg extension can't easily replace a squat in a program, any squat-like motion, like a split squat or a front squat, will get you most of the way there. However, some exercises may still be better than others. So I think some of the most important things are, one, that it meets the, uh, I'd say, orthopedic demands of the individual. And also the adherence demands. So do you have access to it regularly? You don't have to drive two hours to do it. Um, and do you have the ability to perform the exercise heavy, reasonably heavy, close to failure, with reasonably high volumes, without it creating joint pain, discomfort, or mental fatigue? So I think that's really important, is the ability to, it be, to, to be loadable, which is not just can I add small amounts of weight, which is, I think is, you can also consider, but also can I load this in a sustainable way for my body and mindset, okay? Another one I would say is that it places tension at as long of muscle length as possible. We had to go there, right, folks? So, no, I think your research and others like Mao, like, you know, Stasinovsky, all these other studies, there's a ton out there that overall would collectively suggest that if we can train a muscle to longer length and ideally also place tension at that longer length, that's ideal. Mm -hmm. Now, often you have exercises that will do one but not the other. Um, so generally you're trying to get as much tension at a longer muscle length as possible, have it be loadable, and then ideally have that muscle be the limiting factor in performance. Uh, and then I would say, even though we don't have a tremendous amount of evidence on this, generally having sufficient stability so that you can push the target muscle to failure, I think is important. Uh, we have related evidence on, say, like, you know, stability ball training or things like that. Um, and I think it makes plenty of logical sense. But we don't have necessarily the same level of empirical support. Check out this checklist. While some variables should probably be more important than others, Stability as a concept has relatively little evidence and probably shouldn't be at the top of your priority list. Here are some example exercises that do a good job for these factors. What other variables are there that might play less of a role but still play a role in maximizing hypertrophy? Yeah, the top two ones of the pyramid are rest periods and tempo. And I always describe these as things you can potentially screw up and only then do they become big players. Like if you really, really limit your rest intervals to where you're not even resting, say, a minute or 90 seconds between sets of hypertrophy training exercises, uh, and we've seen that in multiple studies now, and I think the most recent data would indicate somewhere between one to two minutes is probably sufficient for rest. So generally, I recommend people are resting, like, say, two minutes or longer between sets for hypertrophy training. Eric also noted that he suspects that more advanced lifters, performing lower body lifts especially, might need a bit more rest than our meta-analysis would suggest. But there's a lot of ways to work around this. Um, I've talked a lot about antagonist paired sets. There's a recent study that actually did find that antagonist paired sets are a great way to reduce training time without sacrificing hypertrophy. I've made a whole video on the topic you can check out, but antagonistic paired supersets refer to supersetting or interspersing two exercises involving opposing muscle groups, like the biceps and triceps, chest and back, or quads and hamstrings. An example would be a dumbbell press and a dumbbell row. By supersetting these two exercises, you can cut down on workout time by 50%, or free up time to do more volume. What about tempo? Yeah, tempo is a funny one. So uh, tempo has traditionally been screwed up by people who are focusing too much on quote-unquote time under tension. 
to the point where they're not thinking about the actual magnitude of tension, just the time spent contracting. Now, if I want to use a, uh, an explanation by going extreme here, we live in a gravity well on the planet Earth. We're always under some degree of tension. Do we count all of that? At what point do we count it? So then the real question is, is do I need to be performing my exercises in such a way on the eccentric, isometric, and concentric to try to get more out of each rep? So what's relevant here is that we know eccentrically we're typically stronger. When you see someone sink a squat, you don't know if they're going to fail unless they're really overloaded past their capacity until they start to get in and out of the bounce into the hole in a powerlifting meet. Mm -hmm. That's because they can control probably 20% more on average load eccentrically than they can concentrically, right? So this means that we can train slower on the eccentric without sacrificing too much performance on the concentric, but there's probably some limit to that. Indeed, based on some of the most recent review papers out there, reps lasting much longer than around 8 seconds per rep probably won't be ideal for muscle growth. No matter the tempo, the more important thing seems to be training closer to failure, volume, and other bigger players. Eric did mention one more point made in the latest research. But what you don't want to do is, one, purposely slow down the concentric, for one, generally performing the concentric with as much effort as possible and letting the concentric speed be dictated by the load is going to mean the highest muscle forces. So I think so long as the eccentric is under some control, whether it's fast or slow, which the data supports, and then putting maximal effort into the concentric should be your default. You could make an argument in some cases for, say, maybe a slight pause in the, in the lengthened position. So my general recommendation is some control in the eccentric, appropriate for the load, your comfort, the exercise, and then an explosive concentric that is also going to be at whatever speed is appropriate for the load you're using, that's going to maximize outcomes. When I pressed Eric for specific recommendations, instead of being so goddamn nuanced, he recommended a 2-4 to four second eccentric and a concentric that's as quick as possible, which usually means around 1-3 to three seconds. Have we built the pyramid? We have. And don't let anyone tell you that supposedly Egyptians did this long, long ago. No. Time travel... Stole my idea, still trying to figure out how to get my Delaware Corporation, very real lawyers, back in time. I've watched The Terminator at least six times this week to figure it out. We're almost there. But ancient Egypt, you're getting sued. You watch out. Eric, where can people find your work? You can find me at a few different places. Probably the best one-stop shop is 3dmusclejourney.com. That is the number three, the letter D, the, the words musclejourney.com. From there, you can find links to Mass Research Review, the Muscle and Strength Pyramids, our YouTube channel, our blog posts that we don't update anymore, but there's still some great blogs to read, and then any other content that I put out where I'm on other amazing channels, like maybe Wolf Coaching, will be on my Instagram at Helms3DMJ. Shout out to Mass Research Review. I bought a lifetime subscription as a first time first year undergrad. My man. My little money went to mass and it was money well spent. Well, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. So all of you undergrads who only have a few hundred dollars to your name, take out a loan and buy a lifetime subscription, because that's what we want to do here at Mass. It's bankrupt undergrads. Take out more credit cards, pay our accounts, we'll see you next time. Peace. Peace.